Hey, if today's question was, how can I make my biceps stronger? Uh, we'd all answer, well, go to the gym, do some more curls. If the question was, how do I make my pecs stronger? Everyone would answer, do more bench pressing or a few more push-ups. We all know how to make our bodies stronger. But if the question is, how do I get stronger in my faith? Uh, do the answers come so easily? How do I get stronger in my faith? Some of you are thinking, well, I ought to show up at church more. Yes, you should. Every week, regardless of the weather. I'm glad you're here today. Uh, maybe I should pray more. That's always a good thing. Maybe I should read my Bible more. You know I'm an advocate for 15 minutes a day in a chair that you enjoy where you read a text and you let God speak to you through that text. These are all good activities. They add muscle to your faith. But if that was all that was necessary to get stronger in our faith, then why do so many of us who come to Willow year after year and we pray and we read our Bibles regularly, why do we suffer from spiritual weakness as often as we do? This question that we're addressing today had, had tormented me for about the first third of my spiritual life. I would say to myself, if the God I love and serve is the possessor of limitless might, and if dozens of verses in the Bible seem to indicate that he's more than willing to infuse that strength into my life, why do I walk around feeling weak as often as I do? Why do I fall so easily to some temptations? Not just once, not just twice, but again and again. Why don't I step up and take more risks in following God? If only I were stronger, right? About 20 years ago, God revealed something to me that reframed this whole issue for me. I want to explain it to you, but in order to do so, I have to take you on a little field trip through some of the sticky pages in the Bible. But if you hang with me, I promise there will be a payoff in just a little while. We're going to start the field trip in Egypt about the time of the Exodus. Shortly after the 10th plague, which as you know, was the visit of the angel of death, Pharaoh finally says to Moses, you can leave Egypt. Take your people and move out. That's what you've wanted all these years. You're free to leave. Moses organized all the people and headed in the general direction of the promised land. Shortly after they had left, Pharaoh suddenly realizes that all of his cheap labor is gone, which means the whole Egyptian economy is probably going to move into recession, which is going to threaten his power. So he calls out the Egyptian National Guard and he says, we got to bring all these Israelites back. It's the only way to protect our economy. In a matter of hours, the National Guard catches up to the snail's pace migration of the Israelites. And when the people of Israel realize what's happening, they fall apart at the seams. They were approaching the banks of the uncrossable Red Sea in front of them and the Egyptians were fast approaching from behind them with obvious evil intent. This has all the makings of an old-fashioned slaughter. So they cry out in a panic to Moses, who answers their concerns in Exodus 14 by saying, everything's going to be all right. Relax, everybody. Everything's going to be all right. God's strength is going to be applied to our situation. He's given us orders to keep walking, keep marching toward the Red Sea. And he says that he will intervene somewhere between here and there. So just stop right there for a moment. Keep marching toward the uncrossable Red Sea and God will intervene somewhere between here and there. Would you have bought an answer like that? God's saying, you just trust me and head toward the water's edge and I'll intervene. You'll see. What he's promising is what I started to understand as a pattern in scripture. He's promising power along the way. Along the way. Now, we would all prefer to receive God's power before a showdown, before a crisis, before the water's edge. But in this passage, God promises, I'm going to give you power, but you're going to have to start walking first. I'll give you power as you walk. I'll give you power in route. Some of you know how the story ends. The children of Israel reach the water's edge. And then God parts the waters. They pass through on dry ground. When Pharaoh and his army are partway across the Red Sea, God relaxes his grip. And the 
uh, the entire army of Pharaoh uh, takes a swim uh, that had a bad ending. But God delivered exactly what he promised to deliver, strength along the journey. The next stop on our little sightseeing tour is Joshua 3. It's actually a similar uh, kind of situation. Joshua is finally given clearance by God to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. The entire nation has spent a whole generation of time wandering in the deserts of the Sinai Peninsula, and God finally says, today's the day we're going into the promised land. Get everybody ready. Only one problem, as they line up getting ready to go into the promised land, on the border of Canaan, there's a river called the Jordan River, which just happens at that particular time to be at flood stage. So it's uncrossable, there's no bridge, there's no boat, there's no ferry. No problem, God says to Joshua, organize the people and put the Ark of the Covenant in the front of the line and then start marching toward the swirling waters of the Jordan River. Again, stop. Uh, if you were about fifth in line and you were marching toward a rapids that you knew you couldn't cross and you had your family, your children, with you and so if you're fifth in line as you're starting to walk into the water what crosses your mind this is madness this is not going to turn out well but then god does something remarkable joshua 3 8 god intervenes he does exactly what he said he would do when the people at the front of the line get ankle deep in the water think about it ankle deep they're committed then he parts the waters of the Jordan River, and they walk over on dry ground. So we see, once again, this principle of power delivered along the way. Jump to the New Testament with me. Watch as Jesus performs his very first miracle. He's at a wedding feast. This is recorded in John 2. You all know the story. The host had run out of wine at this wedding reception. And that's a very embarrassing situation. Jesus instructs some nearby servants to fill six large containers with water. They comply. When they're all filled up with water, he says, dip a little in a pitcher and take it to the head wine taster. Can you picture the servants asking, why would we take water from the tap to a wine taster? He's just going to tell us what we already know. It's water. Never mind. Jesus has that look in his eye that something might just happen between here and there. And it does. During the walk from the reception to the wine taster, the water turns into wine. And it's high quality wine. And the wine taster says, why did you save this for last when everyone's half blitzed? They would have enjoyed it more if you had created this stuff a little earlier. Again, power along the way. Indulge me for one more story. Luke 17. I love this story. Ten leprous outcasts. And they see the miracle worker, Jesus Christ, coming over the hill. And they look at each other and they wonder, does Jesus do lepers? Can he do anything to help us? And maybe one of them says, well, let's just give it a try. So they start shouting, because they have to keep their distance, and they start shouting, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Do a miracle. Heal us. We need your divine power applied to our disease. To which Jesus simply responds, catch this now. He says, go show yourselves to the priest. The priest served as a kind of unofficial health department who would verify a healing if one were to occur. Again, I can just see the, the, the lepers looking at each other. Wait a minute. We're going to walk all the way into the city and go to the health department so they can tell us what we already know. We're lepers. We want a display of power now. Then we'll go and we'll show ourselves to the high priest. And Jesus says, that's not how it works. No display of power now. Start walking. Start walking. And I always think when I read this text that maybe just one of them said something to the effect of, hey, fellas, maybe you don't want to walk. What's the worst thing that can happen? If we walk in the direction of the health department, something might happen along the way. 
Suppose Jesus is waiting to see if we have the faith to believe that he will do something if, if we start walking. So he says, I don't know about you, but I'm going. I love the way the scriptures describe it in Luke 17, 14. It says, and as they were going, there you see the motion, as they were going, the scripture says they were healed. One last time, that's power along the way, power along the way. Scripture seems to be clear about this, that God is more than willing to intervene supernaturally into the challenges of our everyday lives, providing that we are first willing to get in motion, first willing to put one foot in front of the other and walk in the general obedience that he has asked us to go. And that strength along the way principle, gang, has been a game changer in my life. I mean, you talk about how to get stronger in your faith, uh, you're going to have to do some walking to get stronger in your faith. If you'll allow me to get personal for just a few moments, I'll explain how this principle uh, has affected my life in recent days. Two years ago, when the elders of this church and I worked through a multi-year succession plan to ensure Willow's strength long, long past my tenure, uh, I gathered 25 of the senior most staff members of Willow and spent three days with them in an off-site retreat uh, talking about the succession plan and we we're doing some praying about the future and some strategic planning and so. After we got done with a particular session, I started the next session. I sat on a stool in front of 25 of my colleagues. And I said, you know, I would like to make the greatest contribution to Willow Creek that I can possibly make in my remaining years. Would you mind telling me your opinion of how I can make the greatest contribution to the church? Got quiet for a second, but not long. And someone said, you should teach more. And then another person said, I agree with that 100%. You should teach more. And then just about everybody in the room joined the chorus. You know, we want you to teach more. That was not the answer I was expecting, and it certainly was not the answer I was hoping for. Because as my colleagues know very well, and as some of you veterans know quite well, uh, teaching comes very, very hard for me. My top spiritual gift that's been entrusted to me is the spiritual gift of leadership. And I do that almost without effort. I, I kid with other people. Um, I can use the leadership gift recreationally. Feels like recess to me to do board meetings and strategic planning meetings and to solve problems and all of that. It, 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 I could do it almost without effort and endlessly. My second gift is evangelism, and that's inspiring to me. I love the challenge of helping people far from God understand what Christianity means, and so teaching's my third gift. It's never come easy to me, and it always extracts quite a toll on me and prior to that meeting I had been teaching 18 to 20 weekends per year for about 20 years and I had a conscious kind of understanding that that was my absolute limit uh, some of you know that in the late 80s uh, after I had taught midweek services and weekend services for 15 years straight I hit a wall of exhaustion that almost ended my ministry I wound up uh, in a counselor's office, all screwed up, and uh, had to sort a whole bunch of stuff out. And one of the things I had to sort out was that I was teaching beyond my capacity to teach. And it was creating anxiety in me and worry and, and all that. And so I had to cut back and go to team teaching and stop teaching midweek and all of that. Well, you never quite forget when you hit a wall. If some of you have ever hit a wall like that, uh, you know what I'm talking about. And, and you stay in touch in your spirit with all of, you know, the uh, trauma involved in one of those kinds of experiences. So that was playing in the back of my mind when my colleagues are saying, teach more, teach more. But I was playing it cool. I didn't let them know that I was worried inside about what they were saying. So I just said, hey, well, uh, what does teaching more look like to you? Is it going like from 18 weekends a year to 21 or 22, and some of them started laughing, and they said, no, we, we think you should teach about 35 times a year, and then they started giving all the rationale for why they thought that was a good idea, and the rationale was actually 
quite convincing, although I didn't want it to be. And while I was listening to all this, I was sitting on this stool, and I started feeling nauseous. And I was like, oh, man. And I got lightheaded, and I thought, yeah, that looked good, fainting in front of my <laughs> top staff. And so when we were coming into the lunch break, I said, look, you guys go to lunch. I'm, I need a little time by myself. And when I was able to get about an hour of solitude, I processed what they were saying to me. And I had this conversation in my head and half with God where I said, there is absolutely no way that I can double my teaching load and survive. That's not going to happen. Going from 18 to 35 uh, will destroy my life. And then I had to give a rationale to God why I was so convinced of that. And so I said, God, I don't believe you would ever enlarge my teaching gift. I don't think you would ever increase my capacity. It's been about the same from what I can tell for two decades. Why would you suddenly increase my teaching capacity now? This makes no sense to me. Beyond that, I said, I don't think I could su sustain the level of discipline 35 times a year required to teach at the level that this church deserves. For those of you who wonder, it takes me 20 to 30 hours a week to research texts and to reflect and to write out sermons. I found I could do that 18 to 20 weekends a year, not 35, not even close, and still lead the staff and teach leadership around the world and stuff like that and have a family and be present with my grandkids and so. So I just kept listing all the reasons uh, that, that I felt my colleagues were asking me to do something that was impossible and perhaps destructive. And then the Holy Spirit whispered to me something I'll never forget. Holy Spirit just whispered, why don't you trust your colleagues' wisdom? They love you. They know you well. They love our church. They're concerned about the future of our church. Why don't you tell them that you will experiment, take a test, and you will step out in faith and see if God might increase your capacity and see if he might do something different in the future than he's done in the past. See if he doesn't give you, here we go, power along the way. Power along the way. The Spirit reminded me afresh that all throughout Scripture, this is how God has provided His power. He asks for His followers to put one foot in front of the other and walk in the general direction He's asking them to go. And then the, the strength comes not up front. It just comes when it's needed. Along the journey, in route toward the destination that God is calling you to go. In the last couple of years, I have felt... God slowly increasing my capacity as a teacher, and I hadn't felt that for the prior 20 years. And Monday mornings when I say, okay, I've got an empty pad, I've got an open Bible and an ink pen, and I sheepishly wonder, is God going to provide power one more time for this next week's sermon, for this next series? Is he going to do that? And then I feel the movement of the Holy Spirit in a curious way, where ideas come to me that are better than my own, and then curiosity about other passages, and I start looking them up and writing out ideas. And I've had it so often in the last couple of years, I hesitate to talk about it because it sounds odd, but I've had it several times in the last 24 months where the ideas came to me so rapidly I couldn't keep up the writing pace with the way God was flowing ideas into my head. And I've had a front row seat of God's strength being poured out in a way I never thought he would through teaching. The net result is that my faith, my personal faith in God's ability to do stuff is so much greater now than it was two years ago because I've seen and felt the, the little in, investments of his strength as I've been on this faith journey. My love for God, my respect for how he does things uh, is so much deeper now than it was two years ago. Now that's just my experience in that one small area in my life, but I have found power along the way with this thing. And what I want to do with the time that remains in this service is I want to show you how this principle can work in your life. Is that fair enough? How, how you can experience power along the way in your life. Some of you have excruciating decisions to make in 2014. 
You knew coming into the end of 2013 that once the holidays were over, you were going to have to step up and pull the trigger on something in early January, and you've been hoping for a supernatural burst of courage to all of a sudden descend from the heavens that would give you the necessary horsepower to do what you know you need to do. Has that burst happened to you yet? Uh, have the clouds parted and did something unbelievable descend into your lap while you were sitting on the couch so you could fire up and do what it is that you feel you need to do? Um, has it happened yet? Some of you have to leave a relationship in 2014. The relationship started going bad a while back. Coming into the holidays, you thought, I know I've got to get out of this relationship. It's dysfunctional. It's destructive. I've got to end this relationship. But then it was Christmas, and you didn't want to end it around Christmas, but you know it should be ended. And everyone around you is saying, you know it's a bad relationship. You ought to end it. You ought to end it. So now it's 2014, and here you sit. And you say, if I were 20% stronger, I would end it today, but I'm not. So I'm stuck. Some of you need to change your relationship with food or alcohol in 2014. All through November and December, that little voice in your head kept saying, you've crossed a line now. You've crossed a line. This is officially out of control in your life. If something doesn't change in the very near future, the consequences could be awful. And here it is, now January, you're waiting for that big burst of something to come flying into your life so that you'll do something about this. If you're only 20% stronger, you'd be on some new journey, right? But you're not, so here you sit and you're stuck. In a church our size, there are always people who come into a new year filled with frustration, embarrassment, and shame about their ongoing dysfunctional relationship with money. You swore on a stack of Bibles in 2013, you're gonna fix this once and for all so it's not an ongoing bad legacy for your family and then your grandkids and so. But you didn't get it fixed in 2013. And now we're in 2014 and you're saying, if I were 20% stronger, I'd fix this, but I'm not. So here I sit. Some of you have tough career decisions to make. You know exactly what you need to do. You just don't have that extra 20% necessary to get you over the top so you can do what you need to do. Some of you have a marriage that isn't going to make it through 2014 if it doesn't get some attention like right now. But you're waiting, you're waiting for the clouds to part and something to happen first. What I'm saying is that there are so many of us here that have so much on the line, the stakes are so high, and we're still waiting for that something to come over us like a bolt of lightning so that we would have the power to do what we know we need to do. And I don't want to pop your balloon, but I don't think that big burst of whatever is coming your way. That's what I've concluded. I don't think that descending power is going to hit you while you're sitting on your couch. And I think you're going to go through 2014 and things that you know need to be taken care of will just get worse. It took me decades to realize this, so I'm not saying this in a cavalier fashion. I'm saying this from personal experience. So I'm recommending that you switch to another plan. Instead of sitting on the couch and waiting for something to happen to you, I'm suggesting you get up off the couch and you try the Power Along the Way program. It's so clearly outlined in the pages of Scripture. It has worked in my life. It has worked in the lives of other people throughout Christian history. It can work in your life. But you're going to have to get off dead center, step out in faith, put one foot in front of the other, and walk in the general direction that you know God wants you to go. If you do that, I am quite sure, <laughs> I am quite sure that somewhere along that journey, God will provide just enough power for you to do what you know you need to do. He will provide power along the way. you got to start walking, though. If you don't, no power. 
I told a woman a few years back who had a boyfriend that she was living with and they were hoping to get married and so. She would talk to me after services. I knew her whole family and her parents and so. Uh, this relationship was becoming abusive. He was abusing her. She'd talk to me about it after services. Uh, he promised that he'd do better, and he never did. And she kept promising to get out of the relationship, and she never could. She just didn't have the strength to get out of the relationship. So she'd talk to me about it about every six weeks right down in that area. And one time she came down, perhaps one time too many or something, or I was having a bad weekend, and I put my hands on her shoulders, and I said, my sister in Christ, do you really want to solve this, or do you want to just talk to me about it every six weeks for another year? What do you want to do? And she said, I, I really want to solve it. I, I just can't do it. And I said, I have a recommendation to make. Here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you, as soon as we're done with this conversation, that you walk out in the parking lot and you get in your car, you put your hands on the steering wheel and you pray, God, give me just enough strength to drive to that apartment that I'm living with this guy in. I said, if you will pray that God will give you the strength to make the drive from our parking lot to his driveway, I think God will give you the strength to get you to the driveway. Don't stop for lunch, don't go to the mall first. Go straight to his driveway. And then when you're driving up the driveway, ask God to give you just enough strength to make it from the driveway to your bedroom closet. And once you pray for that, start walking directly from the driveway to the bedroom closet. Don't stop in the kitchen in the apartment. Don't turn on the TV. If he's there, don't talk to him. Walk straight to the closet and then ask for God to give you the strength to pack and pack fast. And then ask him to give you the strength to get back down to your driveway. And then ask him to give you the strength to drive to your parents' house. I knew her parents. I knew their arms would be wide open. This was a bad relationship. And I had my hands on her shoulder right down there. And I said, my sister, do you think you can do this? And she said, well, I'll try. And she tried. And she made it from the parking lot to the driveway, to the closet, to the driveway, to her parents' house. And she ended that relationship. When I see her around the church these days, we simply smile. Because she experienced what I'm trying to describe to you, gang, which is power along the way. She had to move. She had to show God that she was trusting him by heading in the general direction of doing the right thing. And God was faithful and gave her power along the way. Anybody need to leave a bad relationship anytime soon? If you're waiting for a lightning bolt to strike you between now and the end of the service, I don't think it will. But if you go to the parking lot and drive in the direction you need to go, I think God will give you power along the way. Many of us have incredibly difficult decisions to make. We, we have stuff we need to stop. We know we need to stop it. We have activities we know we need to start. We know we need to start them. We have some things we need to fix in 2014. And I urge you on the basis of what scripture teaches to stop waiting around for something else to happen. Get off dead center, step out in faith, start walking in the general direction you know God wants you to go. And then believe that God will give you an infusion of his strength in just enough magnitude for you to do what he's asking you to do. Now this has implications for some of you. It means that some of us need to step out in faith and we need to drive in the general direction of a fitness center. You haven't had the power to go there yet. But if you just started driving in the general direction of the fitness center, I think God would give you enough power to get there. And then if you prayed while you were in the parking lot, give me the power to walk in there and sign on that dotted line so that I could honor God with my body. So that I could honor God with my body. I think God would give you the power between the parking lot and the sign-up desk 
And when he got that far, I think he'd give you the power to come three times a week. And I think 2014 would look all different for you. Others of us need to do something this Wednesday night. We need to drive straight from work to the parking lot here at South Barrington. And then you need to pray and you need to say, God, give me the strength to walk from the parking space that I'm in right now to one of the classrooms where there's a recovery program being offered for substance abuse, be it alcohol or whatever. And when you get out of the car and you start walking, those are tough steps. And you'll have to pray, God, just one step, next step, next step. And then when you walk in that room for the first time and you see a bunch of other people courageously expecting God to help them with their recovery process, they'll welcome you in and you'll do it together in community and you will make progress in an area of your life that has been slowly ruining your life. But nothing's going to happen on your couch. You have to actually get in the car and drive in the direction you know God wants you to go. Then walk in the building and walk into the classroom and he'll give you, I, I believe this to the core of my being, he will give you power along the way. Others of us who are determined to change our dysfunctional relationship with money in 2014, we need to find our way to a computer right after this service and register for that incredibly powerful nine-week course called Financial Peace University, which is starting later on this month. 3,300 Willow Creekers have gone through this in the last two years. They've experienced God's supernatural strength in helping them redefine their relationship with money. And I keep stressing this, gang. You know how, you know, I'm 62 years old. I know what a dysfunction with money means, not just to your own kids, but to your kids' kids, and then it goes throughout the generations. And I've said this to you a hundred times, one of the best gifts my father gave me was a proper relationship with money. So that even when I've had to live on a very little, I could stay ahead. And even when God has sometimes given me much, it didn't mess with my head and I could manage this thing called money and wind up honoring God instead of having it destroy my life. And some of you, again, you, you were gonna fix it in 2013, it didn't happen, and now it's 2014, and it's not going to happen unless you put one foot in front of the other and do something that shows God some motion, and when he sees that motion, he will infuse you with enough strength to register, to come to the first class, and it's, you're going to get touched a little bit week one, then a little bit more the next week, then all of, by the end of nine weeks, you'll graduate into a new relationship with money that will serve you well the rest of your life and on through the generations. Again, this church is so large that I have no way of knowing exactly what huge decision you're facing in 2014. I just know that if you sit and say, I'm not strong enough, you never will be. But if you get off dead center and walk in the general direction you believe God wants you to go, all throughout history, God has provided power along the way, and you will be no exception. Now, if you need just a little more inspiration to get yourself moving, I'll close with this. Think of Jesus agonizing in the Garden of Gethsemane shortly before his crucifixion. Being fully God, Jesus understood what was coming down the pike. He knew about the betrayal of Judas that was going to happen within hours. He knew that the false arrest was coming. He knew that the beatings, the mockings, the torture, the nails, the public humiliation, the excruciatingly slow and painful death of crucifixion was about to happen. He knew all this, being fully God, he knew how this was going to play out. But also, being fully human, he was dreading all of it. As human beings should dread. You would, and I certainly would. 
So in Gethsemane, as you recall, he pours himself out in prayer to the Father, even to the point where he asked, is there any other way we can get the redemptive job done? Can you take this particular cup from me and give me a different plan? You know, when I read that text, you know what I think? I think Jesus isn't feeling very strong that day. He's going, I can't do this. And I'm just telling you, Father, I can't. So can you change the plan to one that I can do? And then you read what happens right after this prayer time. Watch. The Bible says he finishes his prayer time and he gets up off his knees and he walks in the general direction that he knows his father wants him to go. He walks straight into the awaiting arms of Judas, his betrayer. For the next 18 hours, he puts one foot in front of the other. God gave him sufficient infusions of strength hour by hour to make it through the trials, the beatings, the humiliations. Eventually, he gave him just enough strength to carry his cross step by step by step all the way to the top of Golgotha. And he gave him just enough strength where he could finally cry out with his last breath, it is finished. It is finished. The price for human sin has been paid for in full forever. It had all been accomplished. How? Power along the way. Power through each step of the redemptive drama. I'm a member of the family of God today because Jesus walked in the direction of obedience to his father. And his father gave him power along the way to purchase my redemption if you're a believer today if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ you must understand that he only had enough strength to go the next step and that was just enough strength and in like manner we're here today and the spirit I believe is asking all of us what needs to get started in 2014? What needs to stop in 2014? What do you need to fix and really fix in 2014? You all already know what it is. The Holy Spirit's been talking to you about it for months, some of you for years. Please stop waiting on your couch for the dissension of some burst of something because I don't think it's coming. Please do what the scriptures ask you to do. Get off the couch. <laughs> Move off dead center. Start walking in the general direction that you know God wants you to go and experience for yourself what so many people of faith have experienced throughout all of history, which is power along the way.